Hello, and welcome to part three of our series of lectures on the respiratory system. And in part three, we're going to focus in on the exchange portion of the respiratory system. And so basically what we've done is through the process of bulk flow, we've been able to bring in uh, a lot of air, pass it through the conducting portion of the respiratory system, and along the way, we've been able to modify it. And so hopefully we've been able to moisten it, we've been able to draw out the particulate material, and we've been able to um, essentially warm it uh, a little bit. As we get down beyond the level of the terminal bronchioles, and again, the terminal bronchioles TB uh, on this slide over here uh, to the right, uh, we have a lot of structure to the wall. As we get into the exchange portion, we're gonna be looking at a lot thinner epithelial lining, because basically what we wanna do is get to the point where we can have very rapid diffusion of gaseous materials between the air space and the blood space inside of these blood vessels. The respiratory bronchioles are going to be lined by a cuboidal epithelium. Again, no goblet cells, normally no ciliated cells. Uh, and these cuboidal epithelial cells are going to be clara cells, so producing proteoglycans and glycosaminoglycans to coat the lining uh, to protect the lining and to essentially reduce surface tension. We're going to have small amounts of connective tissue within the wall and a little bit of smooth muscle, uh, but again, what we're going to end up with is going to be a very flexible structure because we're going to be involved with breathing in and breathing out, uh, kind of expanding and, and, and uh, allowing recoil uh, in this area. And so we want a lot of damage uh, to the air passageways. Uh, but what's significant is that if we take a look at these respiratory bronchioles, we see kind of clusters or knobs of smooth muscle, uh, which are going to be present within the walls. And these are going to be important because they're going to regulate blood flow, with, or not blood flow, they're going to regulate airflow. So they're essentially regulating the, the passage of air uh, into what will be the alveoli, which are going to be the primary structures involved for uh, the exchange of gaseous materials. So going from the respiratory bronchioles into the alveolar ducts, what we're going to see is that at this point uh, on, we're going to be lined primarily by a simple squamous epithelium with occasional cuboidal cells scattered within it. No goblet cells, it's primarily just going to be these simple squamous cells and occasional uh, cuboidal cells. Uh, the alveolar ducts are a structure that has no distinct wall of its own. It basically is going to be like a vestibule and it's going to open up into cul-de-sac-like alveolar sacs, and the alveolar sacs and then are going to open up into uh, multiple cup-like alveoli. But all of these alveolar ducts, the alveolar sacs, and the alveoli are all going to be lined by then these simple squamous epithelial cells. A little bit of collagen there, fine collagen there for support, a little bit of smooth muscle here and there to regulate and control airflow, but not a lot because you want to minimize the wall structure. Lots of elastic fibers that are going to be present there, but not in an overwhelming way. They're going to be there as a, a fine supportive meshwork so that we have the ability to expand and recoil without damage. But again, minimize the distance between the air and the bloodstream. We take a look at the alveolar wall, and we've got an electron micrograph here so that uh, kind of darkest struct, dark uh, kind of structure in the center of that is a red blood cell. So we've got the, the inside of a capillary. The white uh, to the bottom uh, left is going to be the airspace. And so if we take a look at this, we're going to have the epithelial lining of the blood vessel, and we're also going to have uh, the lining of uh, the airspace. And so within the capillary of the blood vessel, we're going to be lined by an endothelium. Uh, it's going to be a flattened, very, very thin uh, epithelial lining, non-fenestrated, and we'll talk about this in the, the next series of lectures when we're going to talk about the circulatory system, but it's going to be a continuous capillary. So we're going to keep the fluids within the capillary system, within the capillary network, within the circular system. No lymphatic capillaries, uh, not a whole lot else going on, but we're going to have the endothelial cap, um, flat, uh, simple squamous cell, essentially on its basal lamina fused with the basal lamina of the simple squamous cell for the alveolar lining. And now the lining of the alveolar 
uh, space, essentially the lining of the respiratory tract, it's going to be a simple squamous epithelial cell referred to as an alveolar type 1 cell. Now these cells, very, very thin, very, very flat, again, to minimize uh, the distance between the airspace and the inside of the bloodstream. So if you take a look at that uh, electron micrograph, it's really difficult to see where is the boundary between the endothelial cell, the capillary cell, and the lining cell for uh, the alveoli in the airspace because they're so thin and so close to one another. Now, the alveolar type 1 cells, again, are going to minimize the, the thickness there so that we can allow for diffusion to occur very rapidly. The type 1 alveolar cells are going to cover about 95% of the alveolar surface. They're going to cover the majority of uh, the airways, again, to minimize the diffusion distance that's needed. Now, occasionally, you're going to see uh, some cuboidal cells. These cuboidal cells are going to be type 2 alveolar cells. They're also called septal cells. Um, they're also called great alveolar cells. So they're cuboidal cells. They're going to have rounder nuclei, generally not throughout the, the region where you're going to have the, the type 1 uh, alveolar cells, uh, but they're going to be at septal junctions. They're going to be at, at kind of like boundaries from the walls. Uh, it's estimated that the type 2 alveolar cells are as numerous as the type 1, but the type 1, the simple squamous cells, are flattened to take up a lot of surface area. The type 2 cells are kind of cuboidal, and so they're going to be kind of much smaller in profile, and they only take up about 2 to 5% of the alveolar surface. However, these type 2 alveolar cells are going to be still very, very important because they're going to produce lamellar bodies or, or vesicles, which are going to have phospholipid, glycosaminoglycans, and a lot of proteins. But these are going to be the cells involved with producing pulmonary surfactant. The surfactant uh, has a lot of kind of organic chemistry type terms associated with it, you know, hypophase, monomolecular phospholipid film, uh, dipalmatyl lecithin. Basically, it produces a protein covering, which is very aqueous, and it has the effect of decreasing surface tension. And so it's almost like a, what would you have within the detergent if you were doing dishes at home. The detergent reduces surface tension to break up materials and allow for things to essentially uh, be relatively lax. The pulmonary surfactant is going to decrease surface tension along uh, the alveoli of the lungs. So that what happens is if you breathe your air out, there's not a tendency for alveoli to collapse in on one another. So even if they do come in close proxim proximity to one another, they're not going to collapse in, you're not going to have the capillary action kind of squeezing them together so that it takes a lot less force to reinflate the alveoli. You essentially can breathe in and all of your alveoli are fully inflated. Now, there's a lot of problems associated with surfactant, especially in uh, premature birth. Surfactant normally isn't produced until the end of gestation. It's normally not produced until the weeks right before birth. And so if you have a premature birth, you're essentially got an individual baby being born uh, before it's produced surfactant. And that contributes to respiratory distress syndrome. And so it basically is a situation where you often have to have positive pressure to help inflate the lungs uh, because simply the normal mechanism of breathing isn't sufficient to keep the airways, uh, at least the alveoli, the deeper regions uh, of the exchange portion of the respiratory tract open on their own. Now it's possible to treat this uh, with glucocorticoids because it induces expression of surfactant uh, and this is a short-term uh, treatment that uh, if you know uh, there's a high likelihood of a premature birth. You can start this early. Uh, there are also some ways in which you can use almost like an artificial surfactant that are being developed and being tested, um, which produce uh, the same type of function while the body is developing the mechanism, developing so that it can produce surfactant on its own. The important concepts, though, is that we want to minimize this alveolar capillary bar barrier and so we want to minimize the distance between the airspace uh, and the capillary space. And so the epithelial lining is going to be coated with surfactant. We've got the type 1 alveolar cell as a very, very flat cell. We've got a fused basal lamina. And then we've got the capillary endothelium cell, the capillary uh, 
uh, epithelial cell. Very, very minimal distance between these two. They're flattened out and squeezed out as much as they can so that you can allow for very, very rapid diffusion of air, materials from the air, like oxygen from the air into the bloodstream, or the diffusion of carbon dioxide uh, from the bloodstream uh, out in the air where it can be expelled from the body. That finishes up our overview of the exchange portion within the respiratory tract. Uh, we've got uh, one more mini lecture coming up, so hopefully you come back and take a look at that. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at hoffmanj at arcadia.edu. Thank you.